Now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading their free 50-page guide. It's also brought to you by soulhealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer. Check out the website. Find out something new. This hour, we're going to be speaking to Ken Cherry about his new book, The Stephenville UFO. And let me tell you a little bit about Ken, and we're going to get him on the air. Ken Cherry is a fifth-generation Texan and a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He was the Texas State Director for MUFON uh, for over 10 years. At the time of the Stephenville event, Cherry headed up a team of investigators that conducted extensive research and analysis of the mass sighting for the entire year. Um... His book is the Mark Slade investigates the Stephenville UFO. Please welcome Ken Cherry. Hey, Ken. Hey, Rita. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And I just want people to know now that I have you on the air, you know, Ken is the man behind the curtain of Epic Voyages Radio that airs on the Inception Radio Network on every Monday evening. Thanks for the plug. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but but let's start here what got you into studying ufos in the first place what was your draw uh well i did have an experience as a as a youngster uh, i guess it was about seven years old at the time i didn't understand fully the significance of what i had seen but um uh, uh, as a, uh, a boy, I lived on a ranch in uh, south of Dallas, and uh, um, I, you know, kids back then were pretty independent, and you know, you'd be gone all day long, and your parents really didn't worry about you. But <laughs> I was, uh, I came through a, a pretty heavily forested area on our property, and to a wide open field where I could see the horizon pretty easily, and. I saw this strange-looking object just sort of floating across the sky, very silvery-looking. And the next thing I knew, there was a, uh, an aircraft uh, in a sharp uh, decline headed toward this thing. And, you know, I learned later that the aircraft that was uh, diving was a, was one of our early jets. Of course, this was in the early 50s. And... Um, uh, Suddenly, there was this flash of light between the two objects. I don't know if it was just, you know, the glint of the sun or whatever it was, but the uh, the pilot of the uh, jet ejected, and there was smoke coming. The, the, the aircraft that he was in crashed. And, um, you know, back in those days, kids were uh, seen and not heard. Uh, that was the rule. But from uh, what I heard from my parents and from their friends around, it was still pretty sparsely populated country back in that time uh, was, you know, the, the, everybody was a buzz about rescuing this pilot from the trees that he'd come down his parachute and hung up in the trees. And uh, I may have been the only one or at least the only person that I knew of that saw what I'd later realized was a classic uh, flying saucer. So, well, I- <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, <laughs> It's one of those events in your life that has just burned into your memory. You just never forget it, even if you're six or seven years old. And that's something that I think is really interesting is that people poo-poo sightings. And, I mean, I've never seen a UFO personally. At least I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Um, But it seems like individuals that have had a sighting or some kind of encounter there, you know, it is is there. They they believe it one hundred percent. You can't waver them off of that opinion because now it's part of their life. Mm. And I, I just think that that's really interesting. Um, you know, it's kind of like believing a ghost. If you've seen a ghost, you've seen a ghost. <laughs> and, and you know, and you can't like say, well, I really didn't see it, and it was my imagination. 
Because yeah, uh, I, I uh, you know, I approach uh, the UFO subject just like uh, you would anything else that uh, you want proof. I mean, uh, at, over the course of time that I was the uh, state director was about a dozen years. Um, you know, I was approached by many, many witnesses that, uh, you know, would tell this incredible tale that, um, you know, was not supported by the facts, and they would get upset when we would explain it away as some sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, an alignment of a particular uh, planetary bodies or a sun dog or, you know, something, some ordinary phenomenon. And I was accused of being, uh, you know, somebody who was interested in covering up the truth. And of course, Frankly, nothing could be further from the truth, but, uh, you know, I need to see evidence and facts and uh, uh, to support or, you know, then it just remains an unidentified flying object. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything that everybody sees is from some other planet, you know, or, you know, the little green men in it. And so, you know, I'm a skeptic for the most part, but on the other hand, <laughs> I know you know, as many witnesses have said, I know what I saw. And uh, <laughs> um, we did still have a policy back in the early days. I think it was started by Truman was uh, the order to shoot these things down. And of course, that didn't work it to our favor very well, because at one point, I think it was a, a Lieutenant General Chitlaw who said, was interviewed in a national magazine back in the early 50s, said that, you know, we've lost hundreds of planes around the world uh, trying to force these things down. And so eventually they did uh, reverse the policy and, uh, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, we stopped losing planes at least and uh, trying to do you know, force something. So uh, apparently they were, they have reacted in self-defense and not offensively. At least that's the way uh, the stats seem to indicate. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be talking about your book, uh, Mark Slade Investigates the Stephenville UFO. But before we start digging into the details, you know, one of the things that I just want to have a little discussion about is why you decided to write this per this book as more of a historical fiction versus a nonfiction case history on the Stephenville incident. <laughs> well, um, the the case itself was uh, pretty incredible. Uh, some of the obstacles that I and my team ran into. Um, made me really question a, a, a lot of things about my own organization's commitment to uh, making public, uh, you know, the the uh, the findings in uh, in a timely manner. But anyway, uh, when I did begin the book, it was later on in the year of 2008 is when this sighting took place. Was uh, uh, I guess the national and international attention was really. Uh, brought to bear on this case in about uh, January the 10th or so of uh, 2008. But uh, unbeknownst to most people, the UFO sightings continued pretty much throughout the year. And we did pursue, uh, you know, talking to witnesses and, and collecting evidence through that entire year. And at the, at the end of that, uh, I decided that, um, you know, I was going to write a tell-all book <laughs> and um, largely about my own organization uh, uh, but what happened was that I was approached by so many people uh, because of all of the numerous numerous uh, uh, newspaper articles uh, citing me and who I was and basically how to contact me uh, I think at one point there were three uh, news trucks in my <laughs> driveway you know, waiting to their turn to come in to report on this locally. It was, it was a very, very uh, popularly followed story. I mean, we had inquiries from around the world, frankly, and with that exposure, uh, became another very interesting aspect of it. it was I, I began to have people calling me who were whistleblowers, people who had facts and, and information. Uh, that from their positions they were, they could not go public with, but were interested in not only helping the case, but helping the case of 
the public disclosure of uh, the real truth behind the UFO phenomenon. And so the story continued to change. I think I probably rewrote it in draft form, you know, six or seven times before the final uh, writing. But when it was uh, early, even early on, it was clear that it had to be written as a novel because so many of the people who came forward <clears throat> had uh, high classifications, <clears throat> high security classifications. And, you know, I couldn't make their identities known. Um, just as examples, I had uh, three scientists who claimed to work at S4 in Area 51, uh, CIA uh, agents, uh, one NSA contractor, uh, and NASA scientists. Uh, it's amazing how many people there are out there who are sitting on probably the granddaddy of all secrets, all conspiracies. And uh, many, many of them would like the public to know the full truth. And so I really didn't have any um, uh, any other choice but to make it a novel. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and it took a long time to develop. I, I think I stopped counting at 100. Well, I did stop counting at 150 uh, from calls from witnesses and uh, other people who offered information. And I, so, you know, in the course of putting together the book, I talked with and interviewed more than pro as many as probably 300 people. Well, and I guess if you're changing just about everybody else's names to protect them and conceal their identity you might as well just change yours too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, um, the fact that mark is a uh, is a former marine is just a co coincidence <laughs> <laughs> so for people that are not really familiar with the stephenville incident could you start you know and, and share what happened there well sure first, where so, is Stephenville? Let's start well, real basic and kind of go from there. Well, Stephenville is um, a, a rural community, a town of about 15,000. Uh, it's uh, the, the county seat of Erath County, and the, the, the primary um, uh, money producer for the county is dairy farming. So um, uh, the people there are very salt of the earth type folks. This is middle America. It's smack in the middle of Texas. And, uh, you know, it's, it's probably 70 miles or so south of Fort, the Dallas Fort Worth area, which is, you know, the, um, the population center of North Texas. I don't, I don't know what we have in Dallas Fort Worth, maybe seven, eight million people. It's uh, North Texas is, uh, <laughs> I can't count them. They're coming in so fast, but at any rate, um, yeah, so these are hardworking folks. These are not people uh, inclined to uh, flights of fancy. Um, I received a call from um, uh, Angela K. Brown, who is the, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, the, uh, a reporter uh, that on uh, January the 10th, who, um, uh, she was an AP reporter, pardon me. Uh, anyway. Angela knew uh, from some other stories that, it, that had been done about UFO sightings that I was the state director for the Mutual UFO Network here in Texas. And she called me up and asked, uh, what did I think about this uh, report, uh, an article in a small town paper in Stephenville, Texas, it's about uh, uh, Steve Allen and a couple of his friends who had uh, uh, seen this enormous UFO on the early evening of uh, January the 8th. And, um, uh, you, know, you know, and if I did place any credibility in it, what did I plan to do about it? So, you know, I mentioned to her then that we had been receiving a, a high number of, uh, of sighting reports in December of two, 2007 of the 254 counties in Texas, the four counties uh, in and around Erath had the highest concentration of UFO reports, uh, you know, in the, in the entire state. So we knew something was going on there. And I mentioned to her that I was planning to send a team 
uh, down to uh, Stephenville uh, to interview witnesses that we had quite a number already. Well, Angela printed that story, and it went out on the AP wires all over the country, and it ended up internationally. And the next thing I knew, my phone just exploded. I mean, it rang off the hook all hours in the, of the day and night for months. And uh, a lot of it was media interest and, uh, um, you know, I, uh, uh, when, uh, when we did uh, – go to uh, uh, interview folks. I really wasn't prepared for what we what ran into. Um, there's a little town just south of Stephenville, just a couple thousand people or so called Dublin. And it's the its main claim to fame is that it's the uh, home of the original Dr. Pepper. And uh, the Dr. Pepper folks there were, were very kind. When they read the story that we're playing, come down and interview folks, they said, Hey, why don't you come here? Uh, we have quite a few people from Dublin and also saw it, and we'll uh, sponsor you at the Rotary Club, and we'll we'll bring Dr. Pepper and popcorn for everybody, and we'll help you, you know, to kind of police the place. And so I took them up on their offer. And when when I got there, we this went, story went out on all the newspapers that we were going to be meeting there, and it caused a. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, a traffic jam in this little town. There was hardly a parking spot left anywhere. And when I got there, I was just amazed at the number of camera crews, film crews, sound crews, you know, from all over the country. And there was one Japanese correspondent there. And, uh, there was some uh, Brit uh, uh, gr uh, group uh, camera crew that had been in New York City filming something for a documentary and apparently got a call and they were told to come down there and just drop what they were doing. So right off the bat, it was just, <clears throat> you know, just a chaotic. It, and uh, I think uh, the Dr. Pepper folks who helped us out there said that the building had 500 people in it. They had never had more than about 200 in that room before. The, there was really only standing room. People were turned away because there was no, no other space. But among those, we had probably 75 or 80 uh, witnesses initially. We ended up um, uh, uh, reserving uh, for an, another weekend and also had a, a pretty large turnout. But the initial story that appeared was uh, uh, Steve Allen and his friends, uh, one of whom had been a uh, many years working for American Airlines as a uh, airline uh, uh, stewardess. Uh, and I'm sorry, that's not the PC <laughs> term now. But at any rate, another person, uh, uh, Steve Allen was a private pilot. And of course, this uh, uh, lady had many years in the aviation business. And uh, she, the, her husband, uh, and uh, so the three of them described this craft that was, they said, about a mile long and a quarter mile wide, flying at around 2,000 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, Steve had estimated the, the, high, the altitude and the speed based on his own experience flying across this uh, same stretch uh, on the horizon. And... Uh, at some point, uh, they described a number of F-16s that uh, showed up chasing this object, and they were an afterburner. And uh, you know that at, at some point, the uh, the this craft just uh, you know hit the accelerator and disappeared from view. With <laughs> left the F-16s just flat-footed. So. Um, you know, the Air Force initially denied it, and uh, one of the uh, spokespeople attributed what everybody had seen to some optical illusion. You know, this was the crossing of these two large uh, passenger air, uh, liners, uh, uh, cl you know, uh, passing each other on the horizon, creating this illusion. I mean, it was just absolutely ludicrous. And uh, the folks around there... Um, even though they're dairy farmers, most of them have uh, day jobs. You know, you don't, most family dairies do not make enough to make a living. So 
I was surprised that the number of highly educated, sophisticated, well-traveled uh, folks that we interviewed, and for the most part, they were all, you know, gray-haired. I mean, uh, we didn't, even though it's a college community, we really didn't have, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, I started to say stoner college kids, but you, you know what I'm talking about, is that these were middle age, middle class generally well-informed folks who were used to seeing uh, a lot of aircraft in the area. There's uh, this uh, joint uh, reserve base nearby that, you know, they, they see jets, the F-16s flying out of there all the time. There's a, uh, there's a, a good size uh, municipal airport uh, very close by at, in Waco, which is a larger town. And then there's all of the air traffic that's going into Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, to their airport. So these people, it's not like they were seeing something that they didn't often see. And uh, so we took the witness reports uh, seriously and did not, you know, what the Air Force was telling us. So uh, I think the air force in trying to make this story go away did more to fan the flames than uh, it backfired on them but uh, they were they later had to come out and recant and say oh yeah uh actually we did have f-16s in in the neighborhood uh, sorry about that <laughs> but we didn't see a ufo <laughs> no it was invisible um, yeah the people that saw the F-16s flying, did they look, you know, I want to say microscopic in comparison to this supposedly mile-long craft? I mean, did they seem insignificant? Did anybody ever make a comment that way? Well, I guess, you know, you'd have to have the perspective from the UFO to see how big the people looked on the ground. But um, I want to... Uh, point out that uh, of the hundreds of witnesses ultimately that we did interview, there were two primary uh, types of UFOs and people, you know, the, the media has to dub everything so that this enormous craft, you know, they called it the mothership. Uh, uh, but the other type of UFOs that were seen in the area and not not in necessarily in conjunction with this mothership craft uh, were orbs uh, going round, you know, spherical. And uh, sometimes it might be one that would divide into several parts, you know, several different orbs, or sometimes they would be uh, in formation and sometimes not. Uh, but in every case, uh, they were described by all the witnesses as being intensely bright and absolutely quiet, silent, no noise from it or the large mothership. So, um, you know, the other phenomena that occur occurred as a result of uh, this story making so much uh you know, in the public eye, is that quite a few of the people that I spoke with or called me or contacted me one way or another were very much older residents of the area that uh, began to tell me about uh, sightings that they had had many years before and uh, that they had not talked about because of fear or ridicule. And, uh, with so many people coming forward with the Seaville sighting, uh, that they were encouraged, you know, that now they wouldn't and they could tell their story. And I mean, when you hear an 80 year old couple talking about a very close encounter that they had, you know, 50 years ago, they're out in the country near Stephenville, you know, they're telling you the truth. I mean, this is. Uh, it, you know, uh, and the way they describe things is just the so same. So this isn't necessarily the first time that there have been craft spotted over Stephenville. No. As a matter of fact, what I did discover is that the, this area has a long history of, uh, of sightings. And this is one of the things that I do kind of reveal in the book as to why that is the case. But let me say this, that... Um, uh, 
uh, we had a gentleman who was the city one of the city councilmen for the little town of um, uh, Dublin, and uh, uh, he also had the sighting and became very interested in, in it. And he went back through his town's um, uh, old uh, his new, their newspaper and library <clears throat> records, I believe, are sort of combined in in some museum or something there. But at any rate, he went back through the uh, uh, the records and found an account of, in the 1890s that appeared in a little paper that was, you know, no longer around. But anyway, it talked about a number of the townspeople that witnessed what they said appeared like a burning bale of hay in the sky. Now, if you think about back during, before there was even any other kind of aircraft in the sky, I mean, this is very unusual. And uh, if you think about the people, uh, contemporary accounts of these glowing orbs, you know, that's a very close analogy, a burning bale of hay. And at any rate, it crashed into a structure, and in the debris, they found uh, there in this account uh, this strange parchment, which what they called hieroglyphics on it, and some metal fragments and things. So, unfortunately, that's where the story cuts off. And you know, there's no. I'd love to know where they planted this uh, debris, but. At any rate, that there were a number of other stories that uh, uh, were picked up, uh, you know, from time to, that we heard. So, uh, yeah, you know, and let me say this: if you, if there's a field that you go by, and every year there's bees there, you, you know, that tells you something. And if you can constantly have UFO sightings in a particular area, you know, there's something, there's information to be gained from that. And again, that's something that I go into in my book uh, that was disclosed to me by one of the whistleblowers that came forward. What would they have in Stephenville? Cows? <laughs> I, I mean, well, I, you know, and maybe, I mean, is there any history of cattle mutilation in that area? I mean, maybe there is some secondary objective. No, no. no. And I know we have limited time tonight, so I guess I'll just kind of uh, reveal some of the some of the things that, um, uh, uh, you know. We try. like juice on this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, there's... Um, uh, some I had these uh, uh, people from afar saying, "You guys don't know what you're doing. The reason that their UFOs are there is because of the Bush Ranch. Because you know I did approach very near the Crawford Ranch there at one point, and uh, the the, the uh, largest military base in the country, Fort Hood, is right there as well. So uh, you know the." People found uh, various reasons in their mind why this uh, UFO was there, but one of the Bushes were not even home uh, on January the eighth. They were still, you know, away for the holidays. But uh, at any rate, or back at DC, I forget. But at any rate, uh, that once we found this pattern of many, many years of. Um, uh, of UFOs sightings in the area going back at least over a hundred years, then obviously those that rationale, oh, they're here to check out our military or you know the president or whatever, you know that just sort of melts away. Um, but I'll, I'm gonna I'll drag this out a bit here. I'm gonna say of all of the people that I interviewed. Every one of them accepted the idea that there was life elsewhere in the universe. Every one of them, without exception. And uh, one, uh, a constable, Gayton, who was uh, just a, a great guy, good witness, uh, that we verified his sighting. And, um, he, you know, in our discussion, he said, you know, that would like be, be like believing that there was only one fish in a 26-acre lake, you know. 
<laughs> you know, so you'd have to believe that there was only one one life form in the entire ocean. If you were to believe that, you know, we're the only, uh, it, you know, city of intelligent beings in the universe. And so people accept that. And they accepted the idea that, um, you know, from time to time, we have visitors from other places and, you know, our solar system or galaxy or, you know, whatever, other dimensions. Uh, I don't think that the American public that are, you know, most of the population of the world would uh, have a problem with that, you know, uh, if that were made public. But... I think what would keep a lot of people awake at night is that they're not aliens. <laughs> Many of these UFOs and uh, um, EBEs, uh, you know, are not alien. So are we uh, talking drones? Are we talking some other government thing? Or are we no, talking time travel? Or time well, no, thing? we're talking about an ancient race of intelligent beings that live here in great numbers on Earth. In and the Earth, say in the Earth, say in the Earth, say it, say it, say it. <laughs> yes. I'll oh, say. I'm going to quote you on that, Ken. We are going to have such a conversation. Okay, go <laughs> ahead, say it. I'm going to uh, say it. But yes, they have. They they live here in great numbers, and uh, you know, in the Earth. Uh, so. Um, you know, they ju they have been here since uh, the dawn of man. I mean, we find have found cave drawings uh, of just classic UFOs. I mean, uh, that people you know, caveman did not have the Sci-Fi Channel. <laughs> they didn't read uh, science fiction novels. You know, they didn't Jules. Those before Jules Verne's time. So they 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 drew. They represented what. They saw. And so, you know, we have accounts throughout history of these uh, craft that are very, very consistent. I mean, one thing, uh, the Romans were just meticulous record keepers, you know, they've been compared to the Nazis, but uh, in that respect, and I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but at any rate, um, there are. They took uh, scribes with them into battle, you know, to record all of the details of the battle and so forth. You know, the emperor wanted to know this stuff. So anyway, uh, there's any number of accounts of UFOs, you know, classic flying saucers over the battlefields. And, and uh, I mean, as you know, um, Christopher Columbus wrote in his uh, diaries about uh, uh, the sightings of UFOs. So, you know, here's an advanced race that has been here and been observing us uh, since probably before recorded history. So, uh, you don't, we don't have to look to the skies to, to, uh, to understand, you know, or to, uh, uh, you know, the, these uh, beings and uh, you know, I think that that is uh, part of the problem with disclosure is that that kind of knowledge m might upset the human psyche. You know, no, hey, we're not at the top of the food chain here <laughs> on this planet. Well, and, you know, the question that I always ask, and this is going totally off topic, is if they've been here this whole time, why did they let us have control of the surface? But you don't need to answer that if you don't want to, because we have like a whole bunch more to talk about. Okay. Um, um, let's go back to the um, F-16s, you know, because you said that they were following and then the military said nothing happened. And then they said, well, there were a couple of F-16s, maybe hanging out, you know, flying around a little bit. Were you able to ever get the radar flight material uh, from the Air Force regarding that day? Well, not necessarily from the Air Force, but from radar stations around, uh, you know, the the region. Uh, we did verify the, uh, the UFO. We found it. 
and we did find uh, the F-16s. And so, you know, that we had the absolute proof that they were there. And uh, many, many witnesses who were reliable. I'll jump ahead here because I see we're running pretty short on time. But uh, one thing that the public is not really much aware of, even though the January event was highly publicized, uh, the mothership more or less came back in October of the same year, and uh, we tried to keep that pretty low key, you know, to keep the media out of it. But uh, th- there, we also obtained radar information, and what we found was an 87 percent correlation between the witness reports of uh, this uh, object and its location that they reported, and it lined up exactly with the radar information. So you don't get much better witness reports than that. And, of course, uh, it wasn't transponding. I mean, it was not a commercial aircraft or anything. that. uh, So, you know, and the descriptions were consistent. So... uh, you know, we had a large number of law enforcement officers that had their own individual sightings of this thing. Uh, uh, policemen, uh, constables, uh, sh- uh, sheriff deputies, um, if, if, if folks whose job. Did we get any video footage of this thing? No. Uh, several people came forward with. Uh, uh, snapshots and things that could not be verified. One lady had some uh, had some, had some uh, uh, photographs from her deer uh, cam that she would set out, and you know, the on their property, uh, it would take pictures of wildlife. You know, as as it would pass by, it would set it off, and the motion detector would snap a shot. And at one point, uh, she showed me this uh, picture of a of a uh, deer. And it appeared to be light over it, and for all that matter, it could be a, a flashlight hanging in a tree. Uh, and she said, look at this, and then look at the next frame. The deer's gone. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, a deer in one frame and the absence of a deer in another frame is not proof of abduction, ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but... But, uh, you know, it's hard to describe what everybody was going through there. Uh, uh, the, the, the People were offering large sums of money for uh, video uh, or proof, you know. And um, so uh, we – I did uh, – <clears throat> Uh, solicit and uh, uh, obtain the uh, help of the UFO hunters and their production and their production budget, <laughs> which was very helpful because they supplied some of the um, uh, you know vital uh, support that I felt that we were being denied by MUFON. And um, at any rate, um, uh, they obtained a video. Uh, from a, a gentleman there, David Carone, uh, that got made its way out onto the internet, and many people hailed as proof of this UFO. Uh, but um, our photographic expert, Dr. Uh, uh, Bruce McAbee, analyzed it and the camera, which uh, the UFO hunters also purchased from David. And determined that it was, uh, you know, a shaky camera focused on the star Sirius. And we took on just unbelievable heat from some of the wannabe investigative reporters and uh, people who were really trying to make a, uh, uh, a cottage industry out of this thing. Uh, uh, even uh, Linda Moulton Howe put, on a, put the video on her, the photos on her website and said, you know, this is uh, because it made some interesting patterns in this, on the photographs. She claimed that it was some sort of uh, alien transmission, you know, that they were trying to uh, communicate with us. But the uh, UFO hunters had, had purchased uh, uh, exclusive rights to everything, and uh, once they notified her, she took it down. But, you know, that's just the, the 
an example of the kind of uh, uh, you know hysteria surrounding uh, this whole event. But uh, at any rate, uh, there's much more, much more I would like to get into and say. Uh, but you know, uh, if you let me, I'd, I'd like to plug my book. It's on Amazon. But if you go to my website, Epic Voyager. Dot com. That's e p i c v o y a g e r s dot com. Uh, you can order an autographed copy. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I hope and you. And that's priceless, Ken. <clears throat> uh, of course. <laughs> well, the book is fourteen ninety nine, uh, but I charge fifteen dollars. You know, a penny for the autograph, uh, plus yeah. uh, post, plus <laughs> postage. So it's <laughs> it's a bargain at any rate. But, there you go. <laughs> but we have enough time. Let me ask you this question. Sure. Um, what makes this encounter unique? What puts the Stephenville incident really up there with things like the Phoenix Lights, uh, Rendlesham? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, every all of them have their own unique characteristics, but it is has moved from, you know. Joe saw some lights out in the sky to being considered a major event. What, 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 what happened or what is it around this event that has kind of put it into that kind of spotlight? Yeah. When I, uh, I was on the, uh, uh, Dateline, uh, did a special on the top 10 UFO cases. And I think they, they ranked, uh, Stephenville number three, and uh, I believe uh, Phoenix Lights uh, number two or so forth. But um, a Stephenville and and the Phoenix um, events uh, were unique in the large number of witnesses uh, who were telling a consistent story. And of course, in the Stephenville case, we did obtain. Uh, two different uh, radar studies that confirmed uh, the existence of this UFO and in one case uh, and in one incident rather uh, you know the fact that the military did uh, ha- pursue it in uh, F-16 so first of all you had large number of which is very unusual the typical um, sighting report that I would get uh, through my office as a state director uh, for over about 12 years was, you know, one person typically, you know, goes out, takes their dog out for, you know, uh, to take a leak or they go out to smoke a cigarette, you know, late at night and they look up and say, I saw something. And then occasionally you'll have uh, a man and a wife who saw something and then you'll have you know, a whole family that says they saw something and they'll describe it. Uh, but then it becomes more significant when you have a witness on one side of town and another that, you know, no relationship between the two that describe exactly the same thing. But then when you have 50, 100, 150, 200 people who are telling you a consistent story, then it's very significant. In other words, this is something that would be accepted as proof in a court of law. I mean, when you have so many expert observers, you know, like law enforcement officers, military people, and that sort of thing. So uh, that in itself made it unique. But then the rest of the story is pretty much in my book. But I will say this, that of the whistleblowers that approached me, uh, this was a, a a test, as was, in my opinion, the, uh, the Arizona event. And there are at least three groups, uh, one who is hell-bent on disclosure and the other equally hell-bent on non-disclosure. And then there's them, you know, the others. Uh, that all have their own agendas. And I've, I've heard... Uh, the side, you know, both sides that are for disclosure and against, and, and frankly, you know, I'm in favor of disclosure, but the people uh, that are powerful, powerful folks that are hiding the truth from the world, really, 
I understand why they're concerned. And I mean, one of those concerns I just outlined to you is, you know, <laughs> we don't have to look to another galaxy to explain the presence of UFOs and, ET and uh, you know, these alien beings are non-humans, so we'll, we'll classify them, uh, on the planet Earth. And that could shake the foundations of civilization, in my in my opinion, and theirs. And they'll do anything to keep the truth from people. Well, but, but you know, there there's a different angle that you could even put on that. You know, yeah. if there are, you know, you hear the stories about the extraterrestrials talking to Eisenhower and, you know, contact and agreements that were made. Right. And right. I think that if the American people, or not the American people, but the people of the world knew that they were down there, that yeah. I think they might go after them. And I, I you know, <laughs> and if they're there, you know, well, maybe part of the, just, you know, the hiding it is that they don't get attacked by us, get them attacking us. Right, right. Well, and certainly that might be the, our nature, uh, you know. Or, <laughs> so I think that's a for perfectly legitimate uh, point to raise. Um, but getting back to the why, it is... Um, you know, detest the reaction of the American public. If you if you want to see how people would react to an alien presence, how better to test that than over this middle of America small community? You're not going to do that over Los Angeles or Houston or Dallas or you know New York City. Uh, and I would say that in the test, that both sides uh, found something. You know, to support their argument. In the beginning, uh, the townspeople were not concerned. They were curious. And uh, they knew that they had seen something significant. And uh, they wanted answers. And uh, they were elated by the whole prospect, I would say. You know, I saw people whose eyes light, lit up in this ancient face, you know, when they were describing what they saw. I mean, just the wonderment of it all was, it's like, this is, really, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And some of them had quite quite a bit of life experience, you know. So, um, at any rate, it started out calm, cool, collected, and, and amazed, but curious. And But once the media began to hype and hype and hype and hype and hype, and then they started printing all these ridiculous stories, and then we would take heat for dismissing some of them, explaining them away. Uh, we noticed that the reports started to spike after these stories, and people became... Um, one night, uh, Dr. Bruce McAbee, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bill... Um, uh, Burns, myself, and uh, I forget uh, the uh, the doctor uh, that was with the UFO hunters, one of the scientists there. We were all talking, and suddenly we all were noticing the change in the psychological mood of the town, you know, and uh, how people were seeing UFOs everywhere. There was a kind of, and and Bruce uh, said something that the rest of us were thinking. He said, "Mass hysteria," and we all just kind of nodded our head. Yeah, you know, this has turned to a mass hysteria. And it showed me that over a period of time, uh, the exposure to this very real possibility in people's lives, it changed their behavior. And so uh, I think that was uh, fuel for the non disclosure uh, group. Uh, in the beginning, everything was cool. The, the disclosure people said, see, everybody's taking this in stride, no biggie. But after weeks of this, um, you know, it did begin to bear, wear on people. Uh, even some of the folks who are most reliable, uh, and I won't name their names, but uh, uh, began to see UFOs everywhere. And, uh, well, I will give you one quick example. Um uh, and I'm not, uh, that last statement doesn't necessarily apply to uh, uh, off uh, Constable Gaten, but at one point uh, he said, he's, uh, 
was quoted by a local reporter there as having these uh, dash cam videos. I mean, as he was driving around the county in his cruiser, you know, he had his cam on and uh, uh, recording everything. And uh, three of them, you know, he thought there was something unusual. And uh, they got into a big battle with the county commissioners over could he release this, could he not, you know, it, was, it belongs to the county, yada, yada. But anyway, this one reporter claimed that she had viewed uh, this UFO on one of his cameras and that, that she could clearly see uh, through a window of this UFO that there were alien, you know, beings in there and so forth. And so finally... I think she kind of probably countered on the fact, possibly countered on the fact that, the, you know, she, she was supposedly the only one who had seen this and maybe the county would tie it up forever. But at any rate, finally, he did get uh, permission to uh, uh, to use the video and he asked me to review it for him. He said, I don't know what I have here. So uh, to, <laughs> the, the, the recorder was an old VHS tape recorder. And so... The county, you know, being the county and frugal, uh, erased his tapes, you know, as he would use. And, and they kept using the same tapes over and over again. So I don't know if you remember that process uh, back in those days. But after you've erased a tape a few times and, and uh, recorded We have one it, minute, Ken. Okay. Well, at any rate, uh, two of the tapes were totally useless. The third, the last one was clearly a, a lamppost through uh, a, uh, a, a, a row of hedges. So to believe that that was a UFO with aliens in it, would, you'd have to completely suspend your sense of disbelief. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that kind of reporting just ginned up the hysteria. And, and so... You know, it has to be done carefully. Uh, I agree, but regardless, there are going to be people that react negatively. So, anyway, epicvoyagers.com. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ken, thank you so much for coming Thanks. on the show and talking about your book. And it's always nice talking to you. It's always good talking to you. Thank you, Rita. I appreciate it. All right. I will talk to you later. All right. Bye bye. That's Ken Cherry. His book is uh, Mark Slade Investigates the Stephenville UFO. His webpage is epicvoyagers.com. And next week, we're going to be speaking with Richard Southall about haunted plantations of the South. And in the second hour with Ellen Dugan about developing psychic abilities naturally. And so until next time, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio.